right, so today we are in the Good and Trustworthy Servant, part 26. Now, dealing with the third aspect of the teaching, which was good, then trustworthy, now we're in servant. This is servant part five, okay? So servant part five, but it is good and trustworthy servant part 26. Now, that being said, okay, you know, just understand if you're new and watching this, go back and watch the other ones if you like what you're hearing here. This should have enough good standalone information so you're not sitting there going, I turned this on and he's up to 26 or something? Well, if you you like it, you go back and listen to the other 25 of it. That's all, right? All right, so in chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, we're going to start there. Deuteronomy 28, we are dealing with the idea of being a servant, and now we're focusing on that we are to serve Yahweh only, okay? We talked about a lot of other aspects of being a servant. Now we're focusing on that it's Yahweh that we are to serve and Yahweh only, right? So we're going to begin here in Deuteronomy verse 14, 28, 14, all right? Deuteronomy 28, verse 14. It says, and do not turn aside from any of the words that I am commanding you today, right or left, to go after other mighty ones to serve them. Now remember, Deuteronomy 28 is your blessings and cursings chapter, right? And so we just, now we're shifting to the cursing side. And he's telling you how this this comes about. You end up in the cursing side because you turn aside from the words that are being commanded here to the right or the left. Now, he then links it to serving. Because you, what you need to understand is when you turn to the right or the left, if, you not, if you're not keeping Torah correctly, if you're not doing things with the right approach and everything else that's uh, you know, expected of you in your covenantal behavior, it's because you're serving somebody else. You're either serving your own desires, you're serving somebody else who's influencing you somehow in your life, mother, father, sister, brother, boss, employer, you know, other YouTubers or whatever, anybody that's out there that could be influencing you. Look at the way he says it. When you turn to the left or the right from Yah's commands, you're serving another mighty one. Okay? That's the connection you need to make here. Now, I know that this comes up on a regular basis and probably a lot more anytime the world seems to be having challenges as to being in end times or not and everything else. I'm not going to get into all that, but I will say is this. If you believe we're in end times, you should be even more motivated to get things right. Okay, you should also be even more motivated to get your pride and ego out of the way on how you need to get things right. Because that's going to be the biggest master to whom you're serving is you. I like this and I like that and I think I know so much and I think I'm doing this or whatever it is. Because all of these other masters out there are going to have you think that they're right and then you're going to end up right or left instead of straight. Oh, you can, you can find an abundance of people teaching right now on the internet, I'm sure. It's Shabbat, I'm sure you can find a ton of teaching. And some of it's gonna be saying A, B, C, D, A, anything under the sun. And you got the problem though. You've gotta figure out who to listen to. You gotta figure out where Yah's voice is because you made a commitment, if you made a covenant, to obey his voice. And so you gotta find his voice. Paul tells us about this in Ephesians 4.11. We talk about that like every week that one of the five-fold ministry things, well, two of them that have to do with really this part of the aspect is the teachers and the prophets. I mean, the teachers are teaching you what to do, the prophets are yelling at you to do it. I mean, it's not complicated. Okay, people think prophets is like speaking the future and all that, no, the prophets are talking to people already taught, saying, hey, wake up, stop knocking, you know, knock off the nonsense. But who's qualified? You gotta figure that out. You gotta go out and find that. But you gotta be serious about it, you know? You gotta be serious about that. You can't be doing this for five minutes and think you're, you're, you know enough to take care of your own walk right now. You need to be under a covering of some sort. Some sort meaning Ephesians 4.11. Because he says, otherwise you're gonna be tossed about by every wind of teaching. You'll be a child. And you are a child. I'm not meaning that in an insulting way. If you're new, you're a child in this. You're a newborn. You've been doing this a couple of years? Okay, so you're a toddler, <laughs> okay? That's not to be insulting. This is not like whatever you did before. I don't care if you were Jewish or if you were Christian or whatever, this is not like whatever you did before. It's got too much difference for you to just assume, well, I could just make these minor adjustments and I'm good. It's not minor adjustments. Although, well, when you look at it and say it's a minor adjustment, but it's still right or left, okay? He says, Do not turn aside. 
Because it shall be, verse 15, if you do not obey the voice of Yahweh Elohim to guard and do all his commands and his laws, which I command you today, all these curses are going to come upon you and overtake you. Are you going to turn right or left? Well, you, of course you say, of course not. But do you understand what leads to turning right or left? It's somebody's authority, whether it's yours or somebody else's influencing you. And your choice to be influenced by that authority. This is very serious. Of course, a bunch of people out there screaming right now, oh, you raging egomaniac. You just, you know, what? listen, you can think of me any way you want. You don't like me, go find somebody. But find somebody that's Ephesians 4.11 who's anointed and appointed to be where he says, because you didn't obey my voice. Notice he always refers to the voice. He doesn't just say you didn't obey me. The voice is the anointed, appointed that Yahweh puts to speak for him. In this case, we're dealing with Moshe. Moshe is his voice. Can we agree? But he still has people always throughout every generation that are essentially his voice. Now, in a very long time, we've not heard anybody say, thus said Yahweh, and we probably shouldn't because that people probably making stuff up. But they should be at least speaking this with authority because that's where he already said it. But not only with authority, but rightly dividing the word. There's a lot of mess. A lot of mess. Some of you are attracted to it because it's comfortable. Because, hey, it feels like familiar to some other things you might have done. Some of you don't like it when it feels familiar to like where you used to be. That's good. You shouldn't like that it feels familiar to where you used to be. But uh, if you're going to understand what Yahweh's doing, okay, this well done, good and trustworthy is a vertical structure and thing because it finishes with servant. Okay? And you're a slave to whom you serve. And if you're serving yourself and you're doing only what you want, you're a slave to you. And then you're not being a slave to him. You've got to take this seriously. I know I get excited, I guess. I know I see a lot of you get excited when new, new people, or you find a group that's all new and they're, they've come from church to Torah and everything else. That's great. Maybe. It's a beginning point. But where are you going to go from there? See, most people with microphones aren't going to go find themselves someone to train them, to set them on the right path, accurately understanding and dividing the word, the unadulterated word. Because it's, when it's adulterated, that's the right and left. Okay? As soon as you start teaching something that allows for right and left, instead of straight, you're adulterating the word. And it, it, now this is talking about you. Okay? So now it's not just talking about you necessarily as the one teaching. It's talking about you as the one serving. So who are you serving? Well, I'm serving Yahweh. Well, who do you listen to? I listen to the Ruach. Coming out of whose mouth? No, no, the one in my head. Oh, that's a good, safe way to go. There's, there's no danger there. Because you got three Ruachs in your head. You got the Ruach of man, the spirit of man. You got the spirit of Hasatan, and you've got the spirit of Elohim. They're all talking. Matter of fact, two of them never shut up, and then that's you and Hasatan. <laughs> okay? And they're, they're always waiting for you to shut up so you can start talking. Because that's why he keeps it a quiet voice. I had a teacher one time in high school that we were just the rowdiest group, whatever we were. And so the teacher decided this is what he was going to do. He was going to whisper. And if you missed it, it was on the test, too bad on you. He just taught and ignored us talking. He just talked really, really quiet. And we realized we needed to shut up. Or we wouldn't be able to hear what he had to say. Because it wasn't enough just to see what he was writing on the board. He was explaining. It's not enough just to read the book. It's like just reading what's written on the board without explanation. Okay, I don't know if this messes with you or not. Those of you who know me have already heard this a million times. You were never, never intended, or this book was never intended for you to be able to just read it and understand it fully. That's not insulting. He designed it to be taught. That doesn't mean you can't understand any of it. It means that for you to fully understand this, it was designed by him to be taught. You don't have to like that idea. But see, that's where Paul's the, Paul's the one telling you in Ephesians, you, you're going to be in all kinds of mess if you don't find a proper teacher. And that doesn't mean anybody with a microphone and a video camera, it means that they're a teacher. And just because they may have some talent at speaking doesn't make them the teacher. 
It's the information. Are they the voice? You know, when Yeshua was preaching, at one point they said, wow, this guy's speaking like someone with authority. There's something different about him because he was speaking in the role of prophet at that point. There's a different level of authority. All prophecy means is speaking the word of Yah with authority. It doesn't mean coming up with stuff the book doesn't say with authority. There are a million of those out there. But speaking what Yah actually said with authority. What authority? I mean, I could sound very author authoritative about anything. No, with his authority. They saw there was a higher authority coming out of Yeshua. That was from the Father. Not just because he was Yeshua. And you could see this in the other apostles who were trained by him when they would teach with authority. You see, this is Peter in a couple of the sermons that got written down for us here. The messages that he gave. There's an authority there. Now, I don't have to say there aren't a bunch of guys on Sunday church that sound very authoritative and they're very strong and they're very, but are there, is the information even remotely correct? I mean, I could say things with a whole lot of authority and be completely wrong. What you're listening for is his voice coming out of somebody's mouth. Is it his voice? Some of you are thinking, oh my gosh, I hope he doesn't sound like rabbi. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's still his words with my personality and my voice, okay? But is it his voice? Because this is what it's talking about. It says, do not turn aside, left or right, because if you do, in essence, you're gonna be doing it because you're serving another mighty one. In other words, you've given someone authority in your life, either you, a family member, whoever. Another teacher, doesn't matter. If they're causing you to go right off, could be a false prophet. We're gonna get to chapter 13 and deal with that in a minute. That's where we're going next. Let's, let's understand beginning in verse one. Okay, let's start at the beginning and work our way to verse 15 to see how this sets up. He says, it shall be if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim. Did you, did you never notice that it talks about in these places the voice of Yahweh as opposed to just if you diligently obey Yahweh? It doesn't say about it if you diligently obey Yahweh. But the voice of Yahweh. Because he understood with these people there would always be someone speaking with his voice. The people would have to have some leadership in human form that they would have to listen to. In this case, Moshe. Then it went to Joshua, to Yehoshua. And by the way, if you notice, the anointed appointed, anoints and appoints the next one and the next one. These people don't just stand up and anoint themselves. Okay? He says, it shall be if you diligently. So what does diligent mean? Okay, it means that you're going to make some effort to get it right. Okay, you're gonna pay attention to every detail, every nuance. So do you diligently vet out the teachers? I don't mean like diligently, like look at their entire life story. Because if you looked at the entire life story of some of the people in your book, you wouldn't listen to any of them. Okay, I'm saying when they got the role, do you hear the voice? His voice, are they, are they answering questions you've always had? Are they clarifying things you, you just never understood? Are they showing you things that you didn't even realize were there and you realize, oh my gosh, that's exactly what it's saying because it's his voice. And then diligence is on you. It says if you diligently, you can't diligently obey if you don't at least diligently look for the Ephesians 4.11 teacher. Don't just find anybody randomly on the topic you're looking for on YouTube. That, that may be a starting point, but when you find them, what are you doing diligently to see whether or not they line up? I watch so many different teachers, not all the time, but like I'll check out so many different teachers, and I'm looking for any evidence that they know what they're talking about. And almost immediately I'll find something, I'm like, nope. They're off in that lane that goes that way or this lane that goes that way, right? They're, just, they're all off in their either Christian mix or their whatever mix that they're mixing it up with and you have a mixed mess. Look, I've told, so I've told you simply enough. Look, I've got seat seat on. You see that? I want you to always look when you listen to a teacher. Does he have any seat seat on? That doesn't mean anything, but it might mean something. In other words, just because he has them doesn't make him a great teacher. But if he doesn't have them, you should have a good answer right there that you're in the wrong place. I mean, the teacher doesn't know enough to be wearing a seat seat. How is he going to teach you anything? It's something so simple and basic. Okay? And he should be able to explain to you where the verses are, what color they're supposed to be, and everything else. Because for all of you people out there, white with blue. One blue, the rest white. But it doesn't say that. 
Well, yeah, it does. I mean, a lot of things are said by not being said. When he said in Numbers 15, to, by the way, it doesn't say how many strands to make it either. So why do we make them this way? It doesn't say how many knots to make or twists to make either. It doesn't say to make any knots, actually, or wraps or twists or any of that stuff. It just says you're going to make these seat seats, stick them in the corners of your garment, and one of the strands will be blue. Well, that means I can do whatever I want with the other ones. Where in Scripture does it say, and you can do whatever you want with something? That's his. You do whatever you want with stuff that's yours. So the, the more Peshat simple answer, Peshat being the simple, straightforward answer, would be he's telling you to leave the other ones alone, just dye one of them blue. Well, then what color would the other ones be? White. They would get it from the, these, this is wool. They got it from the lambs. They got it from the sheep. They took the sheep and they got the whitest wool they could get and they dyed one techelet. It's not even blue specifically. It's this color called techelet. Okay. See, but you are always looking for license to be creatively whatever you want to do. And then you'll say, well, I'll say something about, well, our Jewish brothers. They'll say, oh, I don't listen to the Jewish brothers. Then why do you make them like they do? Why do you wear them like they do? We don't have any instruction on what they look like. There's zero instruction to tell you how many strings and what it should look like. But yet, all of you, even with your green, blue, purple, and everything else in there, still make them the way the Jews do. So why would you do that? Because the Jews actually know something. They've been doing this longer than anybody. That doesn't mean they know everything. They know some things. Especially some of the things that we have no information on. So if I have to guess what to do when there's no information, I'm, I might want to check out what, you, what our Jewish brothers are doing where there's no information because they've been doing it longer. So we're told to make seats, put them in the corners of our garments, but we don't know what they look like. All the way to Revelation, there's not a clarification on that anywhere. Not one verse after Numbers 15 tells us what it looks like. Okay? But our Jewish brothers have been wearing them forever. So what do they look like? Now, sometimes they tie them a little differently, but they all have one thing in common. White threads, one blue. Okay? That's, that's really the simplicity of it. By the way, you know, in, in, I don't know why we're going into this, but it has to do with being a servant. Maybe this is one of the identifiers of being a servant. You know, your seat seat is an identifier. I am a servant of Yah. It's part of my uniform, okay? Now, you know, in Ephesians 6, what chapter is that for everybody? The armor, right? The armor of Elohim. It says you're going to gird your waist with truth. Okay, what does the seat seat represent? Torah. What does Torah represent? Truth. What does the blue thread represent? Messiah. What is Messiah? The truth. So, ah, maybe he was talking about putting seat seat around your waist. Gird your, gird your waist with truth. It's, listen, go listen to my armor of Elohim teaching. It's in there. But let's just understand, when you look at what the seat seat represent, if it's, if, if it's Messiah wrapped around the body, around the people, that's your imperfect stained white wrapped in the perfect blue that covers you. You can't get that image with red and yellow and green and whatever other color it's seat. You just can't, okay? It just doesn't represent the truth, the reality of you being washed in the blood, covered by Messiah, but otherwise you're stained. And so we wrap around and it covers the stain. Does it make any sense to anybody, all right? Now, it says, if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, to guard to do all his commands, which I command you today, that Yahweh your Elohim shall set you high above all the nations. By the way, notice that he always says to do all the commands. Not some of the commands, not whichever ones you like and don't like, but all. But yet, there's so many ministries out there claiming to be Torah this and whatever, Messianic, and they're teaching some of the commands. There's been zero commands done away with. Zero. I had a guy who was listening to our Bible studies, our Torah studies years ago. I used to bring him a tape and, you know, uh, in exchange, it was like a barter thing with him. I gave him a tape and he wasn't really keeping everything. And he asked me this question. He said to me, how much of the old, you know, transfers forward into the new? All of it? I don't even understand the question. The question comes from how much can I get away with it? What's the least I have to do? Stop looking at things that way. What's the least I have to do? You know, if you're a servant, you're trying to figure out if you're a good servant and a trustworthy servant, you want to do the most you can. 
for your master? What's the most I can do? By the way, as an employee, you're a slave. You should be doing the most you can for your employer. That's where you're a good and trustworthy employee. He may pay you more, may promote you, may, you know, give you a better slave job. <laughs> because really, you're a slave to your employer, aren't you? It's voluntary. But still, if you're going to be a good and trustworthy servant or employee, generally you'll get promoted, you'll get raises and all those other things. And you're not going to get that trying to figure out the least to do. You've got to figure out what's the maximum, what's the most... Pick up things that are not yours to do by asking, hey, can I pick that up and do that? Can I? Don't just pick things up without <laughs> getting permission, but just, hey, make yourself available. I told my daughter, she had her very first job. I said, and, and I told my son this is the same thing. When you go to get your first job, I said, everything nobody wants to do, volunteer to do that. Volunteer for everything. Anything they say, hey, I need somebody to do, hand goes up. You be the one that always says yes. And you're going to be that, anything goes sideways, they're going to back you up, they're going to take your side, they're going to be on, and that's some of the things that happened. She had some problems with some of the employees, and the boss was on her side behind everything because she was the good and trustworthy employee. All the things nobody wanted to do, she was doing them. Because but the problem is you don't want to do those things that you don't want to do. But those are the, you know, the disgusting, dirty, hard jobs. Or those are the less than high, you know, accolades jobs. No, listen, doing, doing the best you can and taking on all the roles, if it's a blessing to somebody, it's a great job. It's a great job, okay? And we should be appreciating all the people who do all the hard grunt work and stuff that we don't want to do that they're willing to do and, and value them when they're willing to do it. So he's saying here, look, you got a guard to do all. But you can't guard to do all if you haven't figured out what all means and you don't have a teacher to teach you what all means because you've got a lot of teachers out there teaching you all kinds of different ideas of what all means as far as what commands we keep today. Now, we don't keep the ones we can't keep. You can't do any of the temple stuff. There's no temple. You understand what I'm saying? We only don't keep the ones you can't keep. Can you keep Shabbat? Then why aren't you keeping it? Of course you can keep Shabbat. Can you eat right? Yep. Can you keep feasts? Yep. Can you not murder, not steal, not commit adultery, you know, not do idolatry? Can, can you not bear false witness? Can you not? I mean, these are all things that still are, exist today. Can you wear a seat seat? It's a commandment. Can you? I mean, come on. Because he says, if you do all of that, he's going to set you high above all the nations. See, you all want the reward of eternal life and being in the kingdom and having some, you know, amazing role. Although I have no idea why you think he's going to give you and put any, under your authority anything when you can't even do anything with your own life. Got to get that fixed first. Rule yourself. By the way, you've heard me say this. There's a throne in your head. He needs to be on it. But he can't get on it until you're on it first. You have to kick everybody else off of it. And then you hand him the throne and say, this is yours. But you can't hand him it when you're not even the one sitting on it. When all these other authorities in your life are ruling over you. Okay? He says, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim. And then it goes into all of these blessings. If you obey the voice. Now bear in mind, Deuteronomy 28 actually comes after Deuteronomy 17. And Deuteronomy 17 talks about a lot to do with the voice. You have an issue you don't know what to do with. He didn't say get on your knees and pray and the Ruach will handle it for you. He said you'll go to the anointed appointed at that time and ask for their right ruling. You know why? Because they're in a position of being the voice. And by the way, if they, if they speak in, in, uh, inappropriately or they misspeak, Guess who's going to take care of that? He will. So that's not your problem. Your problem is to find the voice in the first place. Now, it was a lot easier in Israel, in Jerusalem especially, where there were judges, there was priests, and there was a king. All three were qualified to make right rulings. Not so easy when we're just scattered out everywhere to know who we're supposed to be listening to. Oh, it would be great if we actually had a messianic Sanhedrin. We need one. 
We need a body of leaders that are respected and that can make right rulings that people will also respect. Here's the problem, though. You couldn't get three of these people in the same room to agree on anything. Actually, you couldn't even get them in the same room. I tried. All right, I tried to have a leadership conference go back to 2011, maybe. 2012, something like that. I wanted to have a leadership conference. Everybody thought it was a great idea, but nobody's going to use their own dime to show up. And they weren't going to be willing to sit there and hash it out and like, let's see if we can actually figure out how to do things where we could all be on the same page appropriately, correctly to Scripture. I went to one in, in um, Springfield, Missouri. This is in 2012, I think. And I helped conceptualize the thing. I wasn't running it. And it, it was a complete waste of time because you had about 15, 20 leaders in there who all they did was say, well, you know, if we would just focus on the major things and not the minor things, we'd all get along. Not a single one. I went last. That was a mistake on their part. I was last. I don't know why I was last. And I said, first of all, I want to thank you all for wasting the last three days of my life because you guys were all completely useless. Oh, I ripped them. Because all of you said, oh, if we would just do, but they're not a single one of them had the guts and strength to say what they thought was a major or minor thing. Not a single one would step up and say, we should oh, we just focus on the major things that we can all agree. What? What major things? Can you all even agree what a major thing is? No. I ripped them hard. They never invite me back to anything. It's amazing. But I, I looked at them all like, you guys wasted two to three, I don't remember, it was a two-day conference, three, you wasted my life. It was completely and utterly useless. Because nobody wants to understand how vertical structure works, and nobody wants to understand the responsibility, and nobody wants to understand that if we're gonna come into, do we all understand in Ephesians, again, I've read this to you like almost every week, right? Okay, but in Ephesians 4, listen to what it says. We are supposed to be coming into the unity of belief and of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim to a perfect man filled with integrity to the measure of the stature of the completeness of Messiah so that we're no longer children tossed about by every wind of teaching. That burden belongs on both the teachers and the students, so to speak. The students need to find the teachers, but the teachers have to be able to understand their role if the teachers can't come together, how are they going to expect anybody else to come together? The answer is because they're not proper Ephesians 4.11 anointed teachers. They're people with microphones who like having authority, like hearing the sound of their own voices, whatever it is. You know, if you've got a big enough group, it could be a nice paying job. But that's not why we're here. That's not what I'm here for, okay? I'm here to give you everything possible to hear the words, well done, good, and trustworthy servant. Period, end of story. Okay? I don't care if I offend you. It's not my intention. I don't care if I step on your toes, smash them as hard as I can. My job is to say I did everything to get you to be awake to what you need to do. Short of doing it for you, which would be useless, it wouldn't, would undermine the whole thing, right? But I, I'm not afraid to tell you. Go ask any of these so-called leaders if, they, if you have to keep Torah. They'll twist themselves into a, into a word salad like the vice president would be impressed. Because they, they, they're going to try to tell you, you can't, that, you ha that you don't have to do it, but you have to do it, but you don't have to do it. Because they do not want this to become about works. And they're lying to you. Your reward is 100% works based, okay? Salvation is not a reward. Nobody earned it. It was given to everybody or at least made available to everybody at the same time by the one act of Messiah, period. The reward is called eternal life. That you earn that. Everything in scripture says that. I don't know, Christianity it just was so anti-Torah they had to turn this whole major doctrine into saying that you know, works are evil or something. Which is why it's amazing James got into the book. Okay. But go, go ask these so-called leaders if you, have to, if you have to, if you are required to keep the commandments. Like, will it, will it affect your getting into the kingdom and hearing those words? And they're going to give you a word salad. They're going to. Because they can't answer the question. Because their Christian-minded side of them wants to say no. 
So they're gonna say things like, oh no, we don't have to, but we get to. Can I have dressing with that salad? I mean, come on, okay? They won't tell you. I'll tell you, you need to do this stuff, all right? Now, actually you don't, but you don't have to get in the kingdom either, okay? You don't have to have eternity. None of this stuff is required as far as like, you know, if you, if you don't do it, you just get death, that's it. If you do it, you get life. That's what Romans, Paul says in Romans 2, that exact same thing, literally says, you're gonna be judged according to your works, either eternal life, everlasting life, he says, or judgment and condemnation. Pick one. But it's your works that determine the reward. Which, by the way, if you just thought logically, makes complete sense. It doesn't make any sense to get anything without earning it. What in life of any value, and is, well, let me even ask you this, what, if I gave you something you didn't earn, will you value it? Never. People never value what they get for free, okay? They never value what they get for free. But you'll value this because you worked your you-know-what off to get it. Now, Messiah made it possible. There would be no reward. Well, there would, death, okay? There'd be nothing. But you don't want to hear this. You want to go listening to the ear ticklings that you want to go listen to somewhere else. That's fine. Go listen to that. I want you to hear these words. I just don't think you will if you're not paying attention. Okay, I think that's what he's talking about. Let's go to Deuteronomy 13. Obedience demonstrates who you serve. Obedience serving Yahweh brings blessing. Obedience serving the other mighty ones brings cursing. That's what Deuteronomy 28 was teaching you, okay? Let's go to chapter 13. Look, some of you are like, oh, I think it's end times. And pay attention. Stop goofing off. This, if you think it's that serious, which by the way it is, not because it's end times, but because it's your end time. You don't know how much time you have. This is your moment. You're responsible for what you hear and what you've seen in the word and what he's revealed to you, period. That which is revealed belongs to who? Us. Okay? Who reveals? The voice. The Ephesians 4.11 people reveal. Let's go to chapter 13 here in Deuteronomy. Okay, verse one. When there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he shall give you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder shall come true of which he has spoken to you, saying, let's go after other mighty ones which you have not known and serve them. Now, I don't think when Moses wrote this, okay, that he was expecting somebody to literally say, let's go after other mighty ones and serve them. Nobody's ever gonna say that. They're gonna demonstrate things that are gonna be enticing to you and you only to have them, you have to go to the other mighty ones. Okay, nobody's ever gonna say to you these words, well, let's go over it, but they're gonna say other things that am amount to that, that add up to that. Do you understand? It's equivalent. Well, I don't like the way rabbi speaks, so I'm gonna go over to this other place and they're, where they're only nice and sing kumbaya and everybody's, okay? That's now you're serving something else because now you're getting the watered down version of what you need to hear. It's up to you. Now bear in mind, we have two examples of things that are going on. In this example, we're talking about the dreamer of dreams, the prophet, whatever, said something and it actually comes true and it happens, okay? We also have in chapter 18, when it says that, how do you know someone's a false prophet when they say something's gonna happen and it doesn't happen. That's in chapter 18 of Deuteronomy verses 21 and 22. All right, actually 20 through 22, okay? So that's the obvious one, right? They say something's gonna happen and then it doesn't. Which by the way, I can point out tremendous numbers of big name teachers out there that have all named things that didn't happen. <laughs> but you still listen to them. Why? They've proven themselves to be false. I'm not ever gonna name a date. As a matter of fact, I have stepped out, and if I was wrong, you shouldn't listen to me. Of course, if I was wrong, then it means Yeshua sure would be already. I've stepped out and told you that these dates that they're naming are wrong. And guess what? They've all been wrong. Every time that someone got excited about blood moons or September 23rd or whatever it is, we're gonna hear that again, I'm sure, as we're heading towards September. Everybody wants to get excited about these things. And I keep telling them, he's not coming this year. Not happening. I'm not, I don't know when he's coming. 
See, but I read the book and the book says this has to happen and this has to happen and this has to happen and those things have not happened. So he is not coming yet. But you all, you want to hear what you want to hear. So it's funny because in 13 we talk about if it does happen and it's not for another couple of chapters, five chapters later we talk about if it doesn't happen. Because that's the easy and obvious one. The guy's running his mouth and then the thing he says doesn't happen. Well, then the guy's false. But you guys still listen to these guys anyway. Still buy their books and their DVDs and all their other nonsense because I don't know why. Because you want to believe them. And then they give you a spin as to why they were wrong but why they're right this time. And they'll sell you another book and another DVD. I don't have any books or DVDs to sell you. I don't have a website that's going to say, if you give this membership fee, you get the really important teachings. <laughs> to me, that's a false teacher right there. That's certainly not an Ephesians 4.11 teacher. Because those people in Ephesians 4.11 are there for you, not for themselves. So I don't sell you anything teaching-wise. You want to buy a Bible? You can buy it anywhere. You want to buy it from me? You can buy it from me. You understand what I'm saying? Nothing that I have can you, can you not get somewhere else unless it's like an MTY t-shirt, which you may just want because you just want something that says MTY on it. But when it comes to teaching, free, always, everywhere. On every platform we can put it on that, that has any effect. In other words, reaches people. Ephesians 4.11 teachers are not selling their teaching. Can we agree? Yeah, but you're still buying it from, from people. Why are you buying the teachings? Do you know there was a time, we don't do this anymore, there was a time when we used to actually have a CD, like an audio CD subscription. It was free. And we mailed out about $40,000 in postage and CDs a year for free. Okay? Problem was that so many of the countries we mailed to, we ended up getting them back, and we didn't get them back for almost a year, so we kept mailing every month not knowing that they were never getting there, okay? So it wasn't the most effective thing, but I'm just saying that this is a ministry that we did what other ministries do, and we did it for free. We spent, we spent the money to send people this, the, the information. Isn't that the way it should be? I'm not, I'm not asking you to give me an accolades, pat myself on the back. I'm just saying, this is, you, these are all evidences right here. It says, we're looking for evidence of someone's a false prophet or not, or a false teacher or not. Now, some of these people say a lot of stuff and then it comes true. But then you gotta ask. It says, are we being asked to go after other mighty ones and serve them? He says, do not listen to the words of this prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yahweh your Elohim is testing you. He's trying you to know whether you love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being. So he's allowing you to hear these things to test you. So how is he testing you? He wants to know, are you diligently seeking the voice? Because there's a part of the teaching on do you know the Father and the Son where it says my sheep know my voice. Do you know Yeshua's voice? Because you're listening to a bunch of people that are not Yeshua's voice. I'm just telling you right out. How dare you? Well, I'm just telling you. They may get certain things right that doesn't make them Yeshua's voice. Anybody can get certain things. Even your church got certain things right. Okay? There's not a church that exists that didn't get anything right or they wouldn't exist. That doesn't make them the voice. But are you diligently looking? This is a beware false prophets here where it's talking about in chapter 13, which is where I made that teaching, beware false prophets, you need to watch that. Because if you watch that teaching and there's a certain quote unquote punchline in the teaching and once you've heard that punchline and you go into any other messianic place and you see that that's what's going on there, you should run right out the door. You know, you should know you're in the wrong place. Oh, but they've got 400 people there and they have these big conferences and they do, they're popular. So is every, this, what is it, two, three billion Christians on the planet? It's popular. So don't let that be your measuring stick, okay? I mean, Olstein can put 30,000 in a stadium. That doesn't make him right, okay? And he'll do that three times on a Sunday. So it's not about popularity and how many people you get. Okay, you have to diligently figure this stuff out. It says, do not listen to the words of that dreamer dreamer, because you're, you're being tested. It says, walk after Yahweh. This is verse four. Walk after Yahweh, your Elohim. Fear him and guard his commands and obey his voice. Ah. So it's talking about a false prophet, and then he's saying his voice is a true prophet. 
Did you catch that? This is why you need to have this stuff taught to you. You, you can miss these things. They're right there. He says, when, a, when a, a false voice arises, let's just change the words here. When, the, when there arises among you a false voice who's giving signs and wonders and they come true, do not listen to that false voice. You listen to the voice. But it's going to still be through a human being. I mean, you could count on just a few fingers or whatever how many people Yahweh spoke to directly ever. Okay? Oh, but we have the rock now. They had the rock too. Don't give me that nonsense. All right? That didn't start at Acts chapter 2. There was no rock before that, okay? Even in Acts chapter 2, only certain people are talking and teaching. All right? Let's understand this. So it says here, walk after Yahweh, fear him, guard his commands, obey his voice, and serve him and cling to him. But the serving and clinging are all linked to obeying his voice. So he's comparing true to false in terms of prophets here. It says, in the prophet that dreamer dreams is to be put to death because he has spoken apostasy against Yahweh Elohim who brought you out of the land. Okay, so let's, let's continue here. Listen, he brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim and redeemed you from the house of bondage to make you stray from the way. So this is talking about people that will make you stray from the way. But they're not going to tell you, hey, come here, I'm going to help you stray from the way. No, they're going to teach you the way crooked with a left and right turn here and there. They're not teaching you the way straight. They're to be treated. Now, we're not to kill them, but why would you still listen to them? Why would you go and attend their places? Why would you do any of these things? Why would you send the money? Because <laughs> some of you still send the money. Why are you supporting those that he says here, okay? He says, they have done what they're doing to make you stray from the way in which Yahweh really commanded you to walk. He says, thus you shall purge evil, the evil from amongst your midst from your midst. See, you guys all want to claim how serious you are about this, but you're not serious enough to get under a proper teacher. You're not serious enough to figure out and find one. You're not serious enough because you just get all excited in a very Christian way that all these people seem to be getting excited about Torah. And most of them are not getting it, and they're certainly not getting taught right. So I would get more excited about your walk first and make sure you figured it out and got yourself under the right covering the right voice in the right part of the structure so that you're learning and accurately getting the information properly. Otherwise, you're going to end up with this stuff where you're going to be, you're going to be going astray. You think you're not. Can we all agree that most of these people are going to think that they're not going astray? This is where we get, Lord, Lord, we did all this stuff in your name. And he says, no, you didn't. You thought you did, but you didn't do what I said. He said, get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. You did not do what I said. You thought you did. I mean, I can't imagine anywhere in Scripture I could find anybody more surprised than those people at that moment. I mean, appalled and shocked to hear, depart from me, I don't know you. What? We did everything for you. Well, that's what you thought you were doing, but you didn't do what I said. You didn't go out, and what did, what did I say? Go find a proper teacher. Go, don't, don't be led astray by these false prophets, false teachers. But you, you joyfully ran and said, we did all of this, and we put your name on it, even though it wasn't really what he said. But we put your name on it. What are we doing? All right, what the elders said, what are you doing? Okay? I mean, you guys talk, some of you talk a lot. I mean, like, about I'm, gonna, I'm serious and I'm, are you really? I'm gonna test the first test. Do you have a teacher? I don't mean like 50 teachers. I mean, do you have the voice that you believe is the voice in your life? Do, have you found that Ephesians 4.11, five-fold person? If the answer is no, then you're not there yet. Paul said you need that. I agree with him. I think you all agree with him. And he didn't just say, these guys have this, these roles. He said, if you don't have these guys, you're going to be tossed about, which makes sense. If you, if you don't have that voice of, of clarity that's from above, then you're going to get a voice that's mixed and messed and it's going to pull you off to the side. It's going to lead you off a cliff. And you're not even going to see it coming. And you think you're on a ride while you're falling off the cliff going, wee. 
You gotta watch out for that sudden stop at the end, though. <laughs> kind of abrupt. You know? Okay? He says, even when your brother, the son of your mother, or the son of your daughter, or your wife of your bosom, or your friend who is your, of, as your own being entices you in secret, saying, let's go serve other mighty ones, he says, these, these people says, look, let's go to verse eight, he says, do not agree with him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pardon him, nor spare him or conceal him. But you shall certainly put him to death. That's how serious Yahweh takes this. Now, that, now we don't get to do that because we're not in corporate Israel in the land with the judges and the whole system in place. Because I don't want people thinking, oh, well, how come you guys don't do that? Because we can't. Remember I said we don't do any Torah that we can't do. Laws have all kinds of jurisdictions, parameters that are connected to it, okay? Are there any jurisdictions connected to, for example, you know, keeping the Sabbath? Yeah, as long as the sun and the moon and the stars are in the heavens. In other words, those things still exist. Other laws require you to be in the land as a corporate nation with judges, etc., to implement those laws. So no, we don't get to stone anybody. I love when people first find out about it, I'm keeping commandments, they'll be like, oh, so what are you gonna do, go out and stone people now? I said, well, I'd like to start with you, but I do say that, by the way. Um, they, they kind of half laugh when I say that. I said, of course not. Oh, so you're not gonna keep the law. No, that's one I can't keep because it requires other things that don't exist. Okay? But let's take the spirit of the law here. This is the level of seriousness someone leading you to go into some place that's not teaching you right. That's the level of seriousness. Oh, but you guys pardon all these people. But they were so important when I got started in the walks. So I'm going to keep listening to this teacher who you now realize is wrong about a lot of things. But you're still going to listen because you like them. I don't see anywhere where it says you have to like your teacher. It doesn't. Or your prophet or whatever other five-fold roles, right? Shepherd and evangelist and, and, and uh, apostle. It doesn't say you have to like them. You have to respect the position and you need them. You have to like them. I know a lot of you are saying amen to that. I can't stand you. Good, turn the channel. I don't care. You can watch something else. I really don't care. I'd like you to like me, but I don't really care, okay? It's not, not part of my job description to make you like me. It's my job description to make you obey him or at least inspire you to obey him, trust him, cling to him, serve him. And if you think you can get that somewhere else, good, go get it somewhere else. I'd love to know that there's other teachers out there that are teaching this correctly. Oh, the ego and pride of you thinking you're the only one. Go show me somebody else is teaching it. That's not me, I'm not, this is no ego and pride. I wish that I was underneath somebody else, let them do all the work. If I could find somebody, I'd gladly do it if he wants me to get under somebody and do it that way. I can't find anybody. Or they're just very quietly teaching in their house somewhere. They're not on YouTube, they're not where I can find them, okay? Now, I don't think that that would be the case, though, because if they really were in Ephesians 4.11, they would understand not putting the light under a basket, make, putting it out there so that whomsoever wills could find it. So I think it would be out there where you can find it. Especially if there's only so few of them around the world anywhere, how are you gonna reach any, any kind of number of people unless you put it out there where they can find it? You gotta put it out there where they can find it. Right? Let's see how far I wanted to go here in this chapter. All the way to 11. Why? Let's see. Um, verse 10. And you shall stone him with stones. Okay, we got that. Okay, verse 11. And let all Israel hear and fear and not again do any such evil as this in their midst. Do you hear that, Israel? He said, let all Israel hear and fear when you start listening to people you should not be listening to. That's all this is talking about. Don't tell me I'm spinning it because it's straightforward. You're impressed with somebody because you saw some sort of sign or wonder, whatever it is that you think made you impressed with that person, but they're leading you off the path. It says, they're causing you to go astray. He says, don't do that. He says, it says in verse, remember back in verse five, it says, they're doing these things to make you stray from the way. That's not their intention, but that's the effect. That's the result. Either you understand that or you don't. You accept it or you don't. Look, you gotta go find somebody that's willing, 
no holds barred to just stay, say it straight and give you the truth, okay? And period, all right? Look, if I, if I could have a giant Sunday church, I have the personality, I could have the biggest whatever if I just want to entertain people. Why would I ever do that? Okay? I had a guy actually come to our congregation. We had one years ago in, um, in Nashville. And the guy sat next to my wife. There's only like 15 people in the congregation. And I'm teaching. And he looks at her and says, he's really good or something like that. He says, man, if he took that on Sunday, he'd have, he'd have hundreds of people. And my wife's like, have you even heard a thing he said? <laughs> you think that would work on Sunday? He just thought I was entertaining and had a, a certain charisma. Okay? I don't do what I do to be entertaining, and I don't do, now I do throw a little bit in there to lighten it up because I'm smacking you so hard. So yes, I do some of that purposely, knowing that it'll get a quick chuckle for a second. But this is about getting you to where you can, you know, a little, the medicine tastes a little better, you put some sugar with it, so to speak, right? So, you know, I want you to take your medicine, so I have to lighten it up just a little bit, but you notice that lightening it up is like for four seconds, and then we're back to smacking around. Because I'm in profit mode. You, I'm talking to the, the choir, so to speak. You guys should know. Okay? So I'm in smacking mode because that's, the, that's cry aloud, spare not, right? That's profit mode. I'm not teaching you anything here. I'm not teaching you Sabbath or Kashrut or a feast. Or, I'm not teaching you Torah right now. I'm teaching you how to approach your Torah observance. That's profit mode. Okay? But you can't be in profit mode if you're not willing to actually say whether people want to hear it or not, not willing to say what needs to be said. But you got to say what needs to be said, period. Okay? And then you listening, you got to own where you've been messing this up, not according to what's being said. Are you getting in the way of this somehow? Are you the, are you the one that's actually the false prophet in your own head, deciding where you want to go, and you're not, you're not wanting to be finding an Ephesians 4.11 teacher and prophet and get under that? Israel needs to hear and fear. What are you being afraid of? Afraid of not hearing the words, well done, good and trustworthy servant, because the next words were, enter into the joy, right? You want to enter into the joy? You got to hear the words, well done, good and trustworthy. And you got to be a servant being good and trustworthy. And you got to only be serving him. It seems like you might need to find that voice. Okay? Very important. Let's go to Jeremiah 13. I'll try and squeeze this in here. It's only four o'clock. We've got so much time. Jeremiah 13. Went from Deuteronomy 13 to Jeremiah 13. All right. We're going to begin in verse one. What do I want to read to? Okay. Thus said Yahweh to me, go and get yourself a linen girdle and put it on your loins and do not put it in, a, in water. So I bought a girdle according to the word of Yahweh and I put it on my loins. And the word of Yahweh came to me the second time saying, take that girdle that you have bought, which is on your loins, and arise and go to the Euphrates and hide it there in a hole in the rock. And I went and hid it by the Euphrates as Yahweh commanded me. And it came to be after many days that Yahweh said to me, arise, go to the Euphrates and take from there the girdle which I commanded you to hide there. So I went to Euphrates and I dug and I took the girdle from the place where I had hidden it and there was the girdle ruined. It was completely useless, right? I mean, after all, if you're gonna bury this thing in a wet place for a bunch of days, you know, it's gonna ruin the cloth and everything. And the word of Yahweh came to me saying, thus said Yahweh, thus I ruined the pride of Yehuda and the great pride of Yerushalayim, this evil people who refused to hear my words who walk in the stubbornness of their heart and walk after other mighty ones to serve them and bow themselves to them is like this girdle which is completely useless. For as the girdle clings to the loins of a man, so I have caused all of the house of Israel and all the house of Judah to cling to me, declares Yahweh, to become mine for a people, for a name, and for a praise, and for an adorning, but they did not listen. Are you this? I mean, be honest, not out loud, but I, look, he's saying that if, okay, you refuse to hear his words, okay, well, where are you hearing his words? Well, I read the book and I do what I, remember the voice part? Okay, Jeremiah was sent to them to, sp to speak those words. He was a voice, they weren't listening. Other prophets had been sent to, to them and they didn't listen. 
Are you refusing to listen? He says, these people refuse to hear my words because they walk in the stubbornness of their heart. So in the stubbornness of your heart, what does that look like in you? You believing you're right when you know you're not, and you're not willing to hear that you might not be right because you like what you like, so you're going to convince yourself that it's right. So you're stubborn. You want to do what you want to do. He says, and they walk after other mighty ones to serve them and bow themselves to them. So again, they're letting others rule. Not necessarily like you actively are now going into another religion and following some other gods, but that you're not serving and, and him and him alone and listening to him and him alone and doing what he says and only he alone. He says, they're like this girdle and they become completely useless. But we're supposed to cling to Yahweh. Now, you may need to go listen to a teaching called Cling, Cleave, Hold Fast deals with this whole issue, all right? And I'm sure I covered this chapter in that teaching, all right? So you need to understand, our role is to become those that cling to him so we can become a people for a name and for a praise and adorning. He says, but they're not listening. I have a teaching actually called, Are You Listening? All right? They're not listening. Are you listening? Does what you're doing demonstrate that you're listening? Because that's how we're going to know if you're listening. That's how he's going to know if you're listening, what you do. What are you doing? Is what you're doing evidence that you're listening? Well, it is. Evidence you're listening to somebody, but is it evidence you're listening to him? What evidence are you demonstrating here? That you're listening to him or you're listening to somebody else or yourself? I think that we really need to understand this. This is really important. The, the, this is, the, by the way, he calls them evil people. Go back to listening to the teaching, go back to the teaching on what is evil. So this, this is a people that's causing harm and suffering and misery, okay, to themselves and others because they won't listen. I can tell you one thing that's absolutely 100% across the board true in our counseling sessions. Elder will back this up because he's there for most of them. The people that don't listen end up in misery, suffering to themselves and others. They come, they get counsel, they don't listen, and it only makes things worse. They and the others suffer because of it. 100% of the time. 100%. Okay? Let's go to chapter 16. We'll stay in Jeremiah here. All right, we'll go to verse 10. Okay? And actually, let's just begin with verse 11 first so we know what we're talking about here, right? He says, Then you shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, declares Yahweh, and have not, excuse me, have walked after other mighty ones and served them and bowed themselves to them and have forsaken me and did not guard my Torah. So whatever's happening, again, has to do with not serving him but serving others. Remember, this last part is about we, need our, we ought to serve him and him alone, right? So let's go now back to verse 10, and we're going to go all the way to 21. So it starts off with, and it shall be when you declare to this people all these words, and they shall say to you, why has Yahweh pronounced all this great evil against us? And what is our crookedness, and what is our sin that we have committed against Yahweh, our Elohim? Then you shall say to them, because your fathers have forsaken me, declares Yahweh, and have walked after other mighty ones and served them, and bowed themselves to them, and have forsaken me and did not guard my Torah, and you have done more evil than your fathers. So it's not just, oh, well, they were terrible. He says, you've done more evil than your fathers. For look, each one walks according to the stubbornness of his own evil heart without listening to me. See, we are, we are, we are way too often taking this as an all or nothing. Like when he says they're not listening, that they're doing nothing. No, they're doing some, but they're not doing all. Okay. That's why I want you to see this as you. Because you may read this and think, oh, well, clearly he's not talking about me because I, I do all this Torah. No, he's saying they're not listening because they're not doing all. They're doing some that's not what I said. And that part that's not what he said, that's the stuff that's serving somebody else. I mean, you got to really figure this out. It's not an all or nothing as far as, like, you're either totally doing something else or you're totally doing him. Most people are doing some mess, some mis mixed up mess of it, okay? Just like those who said, Lord, Lord, and he said, I didn't know you. They weren't doing nothing. 
They just weren't doing everything. Okay? But let's keep that in mind as we're reading here. He says, now listen, again, it's according to the stubbornness of your own heart. It's the heart. Go listen to the heart of the matter. I know it's 64 parts. You've got to listen to that if you don't get it. The heart is the problem. Okay? Some people misquote the name of the teaching. It's not the heart is the matter. It's the heart of the matter. Okay? Because the heart is at the heart of the problem. Okay, it's the center of the problem. And it's right here, again, the problem, the stubbornness of his own evil heart without listening to me. So I shall throw you out of this land into a land you do not know, neither do your fathers knew. And there, shall, there you shall serve other mighty ones night and day, ah, where I show you no favor. He says, therefore, see the days are coming, declares Yahweh, wherein it will no longer be said, Yahweh lives who brought the children of Israel out of the land of Mitzrayim, but Yahweh lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and all the lands where he had scattered them and driven them. For I shall bring them back into their land. Now, this is what we're looking forward to now, isn't it? We're looking forward to this regathering. Ah, but you're not going to get that if you're still walking in the stubbornness of your heart. And you don't want to listen. And this happens like every week, every, every time, sometime during the week, someone will call me up and they're, they found me, they're excited they found me, but they found me as a part of the, the pantheon of whoever teachers they listen to, okay? And, and I try to appeal to them and say, look, if you're serious, then you need to do Ephesians 4.11 and find that teacher. You can't be doing it this way. It's not going to get you where you want to go. And they'll laugh at me and this and that and whatever. I was like, fine. I did my part, okay? I can't make you, you know, get it. That's the old, like, leading the horse to water thing where you can't make them drink. I mean, I can, I can show you where the water is. I can't make you drink it, all right? I can also show you where the... The pit is so that you don't be blind and blind falling in a pit. But isn't that essentially what some of these Torah teachers are doing who know some, but they're teaching like they know all and they just lead everybody into a pit? But it's a very nice looking pit because it looks like it's the right place. It doesn't look like an ugly, thorn ridden, you know, debris filled pit. But they're giving you enough to still end up in the pit because they don't know. And they don't know what they don't know. And you know why? Because they were not taught. Oh, but I went to Bible college and I've been a pastor for 25 years before I came into this. You only have it harder. Okay? You have it much, much more challenged because you've learned the other way so well. And so you're not going to even know what you haven't let go of. It takes years. And it takes a trainer to kind of constantly tell you that's not where it belongs. That's still Christianity. That's still this other thing. That's not what belongs here. You need that. You need someone to do that for you. I literally have people call me up and saying, I wasn't sure if this thought process was Christianized or was it proper, and they'll ask. But you need someone who can answer the question. Otherwise, you can get in all kinds of trouble. I'm just going to skip through this real quick. So in verse 17, uh, no, actually, let's go to verse 16, Okay. He says, see, I'm sending many fishermen, and they shall fish them. And after I send for, the men, I send for many hunters, and they'll hunt them from every mountain. Okay, now, bear in mind, when we get to this fisherman thing, let's not get to the Matthew 28 Great Commission nonsense that the church lied to you about, all right? He says, I'm going to send fishermen. Those are people that are anointed and trained to do it, all right? Not just anybody's. Just like Matthew 28, when he says, go and make disciples of the nations, he told the trained apostles to do that. He didn't say, you need to do that. It's not your job, and you're not qualified. Okay? That doesn't mean you don't have another job that you are qualified for. That's just not your job, and you're not qualified for it. Sadly, we have a lot of not qualified people teaching. Okay? And they need to basically put their mic down and... Look, any of you guys see the movie Oh God with George Burns? All those years ago? <laughs> you guys are old. There was, there was one line that I loved in that movie when, when I guess uh, John Denver was asking the question, like, well, what do I say to this like, big, big mouth televangelist? And, and George Burns being God says, tell him I told him to shut up. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what Yahweh would like to tell a lot of these people with their microphones and their, you know, but he's, he's allowing the body to have to use discernment. But really, put your mics down and go get trained. I know that's going to hurt your income and you're this and you're that and you're all popular, whatever, but put your mics down and go get trained. 
okay? And then you're like, well, who would I train with? Well, that's your problem. You gotta go find that. That's part of the problem. You guys have the role to go find the teachers. Maybe you found one already. You just don't want to admit it. That's part of the problem. I don't know. Uh, in verse 19, oh, Yahweh, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge, in the day of distress, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, our fathers have inherited only falsehood, futility, and there is no value in them. You guys listening to that still? Are you still listening to the falsehood, futility, and there's no value in it? But, but you don't even know which is which. You don't even have the measuring stick to know what's what. You need to get that first. All right. He says, therefore see, I am causing, in verse 21, them to know this time I cause them to know my hand and my might, that they shall know that my name is Yahweh. How does he do that? Through the Ephesians 4, 11 structure. That's exactly, what, that's exactly what Paul is talking about. What it says in verse 21. That's how he's going to cause these things. He's gonna put those people that are there for the perfecting of the set apart ones. Is that not exactly what Paul's talking about? Paul understood this. He knew exactly what was going on here in Jeremiah. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Let's see, let's go to chapter 25. We may go long because we have time and I'll just finish this up. We'll go to Jeremiah 25. And then I'll have to figure out what I want to teach next week. All right, Jeremiah 25 and verse 1. There, the word uh, that came to Yirmiyahu concerning all the people of Yehuda in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Yoshiahu, Yo uh, the sovereign of Yehuda in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, sovereign of Babel, which Yirmiyahu the prophet spoke to all the people of Yehuda and in all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the thirteenth year of Yeshayahu, son of Ammon, uh, sir, uh, sovereign of Yehuda, even to this day, this is the twenty-third year in which the word of Yahweh has come to me. And I've spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you, you have not listened. You have not listened. Moreover, Yahweh has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear, saying, turn back now everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your deeds and dwell on the soil of which Yahweh has given you and your fathers forever and ever. And do not go after other mighty ones to serve them and to bow down to them. And do not provoke me with the works of your hands so that I do, so I do you no evil. But you did not listen. <laughs> Look, it says rising early and everything else. I'm not gonna judge any other ministry. I don't know too many that work as much as I do, as hard as I do to make stuff as available as much as I do. And that's not to brag about me. I feel like that's my job, is to spend as much time making available the interaction with leadership and with the structure so that you can get what you need. Problem is, so many of you are not listening. Now, I'm not if you're listening, I'm not talking to you, but you know I'm talking you. You know it's you, you know I'm talking to you, okay? He said, but you did not listen, declares Yahweh, so as to provoke me with the works of your hands for your own evil. Therefore, Yahweh, thus says Yahweh, because you did not obey my words. Now he says, I'm going to send Babylon after you. Okay? Because you didn't obey my words. No. Well, that's, that's unfortunate. Okay? You want to be, he says, I'm going to make you slaves. You want to be slaves to somebody else? Here, I'm going to make you slaves to somebody else. That's what you want. But if you're serving the Almighty, then you're truly free. We taught that a few you know, parts ago, right? Let's go to Malachi chapter three. And we're just gonna see if I can wrap this up in here. We're gonna begin in verse 13. Malachi, your words have been harsh against me, says Yahweh, but you've, <laughs> your words have been harsh. Yahweh's saying your words have been harsh. But you have said, well, what have we spoken against you? He said, you have said, it is worthless to serve Elohim. And what did we gain when we ch guarded his charge and when we walked as mourners before Yahweh of hosts? Oh, be careful if you guys get into this place. We start saying, it's, it's not, there's no value in serving Yahweh. Some of you will start walking this out, get a bunch of challenges, and you'll start sounding like this. Be careful. He says, now we are calling the proud blessed. 
Not only are the doers of wrongness built up, but they also try Elohim and escape. Oh, this is you looking out at the world going, how come they seem to get away with stuff and blah, 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 blah. Why are you doing that? You're walking out your own salvation, not everybody else's, and their life is not your problem, it's his problem. He's not gonna be mocked. People are not gonna get away with anything. People are gonna reap what they sow just because you don't get to see it the way you think you need to see it. He deals with everybody the way he deals with each person individually. Okay, just because he doesn't deal with you the way you want to be dealt with, that's your problem. Okay? He says, then shall those who fear Yahweh speak. Okay? And to one another, and Yahweh listen and hear, and a book of remembrance be written before him to those who fear him, of those who fear him. Fear him. Go back to the fear of Yahweh teaching. I know I, I bring this in there, okay? And those who think upon his name, and they shall be mine, says Yahweh of hosts, on the day that I prepare to treasure possession, and I shall spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again see the difference between the righteous and the wrong, between the one who serves Elohim and the one who does not. In other words, don't be just looking now at what's going on in the world and thinking, well, how come these people, they seem to have everything going so great? Not really. You don't know them. You judge what you don't know. I mean, do you know the misery, suicide, whatever other rate of, of, of really, really, really rich people is? Really famous people is? Because they're miserable? Even though they, quote, unquote, have everything? So you don't be careful what you're judging. He's dealing with you. You deal with you. Don't worry about me, the other person next to you, people in another country, another part of town. Don't worry about any of that stuff, all right? You be a light by doing your part and showing what it looks like to do it right, okay? To walk it out. Go to Matthew 24. And so we are gonna wrap this thing up. I got two more here. The last part's always a tough one for me to know. Did I leave enough for one more part or did I, did I squeeze it all into this last part? Matthew 24, verse 45. All right. Who then is a trustworthy and wise servant? Gee, we've been talking about that now for 26 weeks. Whom his master set over his household to give them food in season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, having come, shall find so doing. <laughs> Truly I say to you that he shall set him over all his possessions. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master's delaying in his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to drink and eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant shall come on a day when he doesn't expect it. And at an hour that he does not know, I shall cut him in two and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh-oh. All right, so let's understand what it's talking about here, Okay. You know, when he talks about, this is all, of course, Matthew 24, end time stuff, all these kind of things. And he says, look, it says, you need to know, all right, who is a trustworthy servant. Let's go back a little bit. He goes, um, verse 42, watch therefore, for you don't know the hour when the master's coming. And know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched over the night, excuse me, watched and not allowed the house to be broken into. Because of this, be ready too. So you gotta be ready. Because he says, he's coming in an hour, you don't expect him. All you end times people, knock it off. It is always your end time. In other words, time for you to make sure you're the master who's on guard. That's watching. So you're not the virgins who left their lamps empty. All the other parables that cover all of these type of concepts. He's making it really clear. He's not coming when you expect. Why do I know this? Because there's so many people in the world that think they figured this all out and they still don't have their act together. He's going to come because they're acting like these guys. Oh, but you don't, you know. And then you guys, you got, are you the evil servant? The evil servant isn't necessarily the one beating people and drinking and eating that way. It's the evil servant is the one who's acting like, well, he's delaying and coming. I don't need to worry about anything. I can do whatever I want. That's essentially what he's talking about. I can just go about living my life any which way I want because he's delaying, so I've got time. You don't know how much time you have. You don't have any time. Your time is now, okay? And we used to have a ministry called Now is the Time Ministries because now is always the time, okay? There is no tomorrow, no yesterday, there's only now. So you gotta be walking it now, living it now, clinging to him now, serving him now, everything now. You don't know how many tomorrows you get. Nobody does. 
Look, Rebus and Joanne was talking about, you know, her son Kelly was sitting on the porch when a tree hit the house and hit him. But you know what? That could have taken him out. It didn't. It certainly could have. He's a young man. You don't, I mean, saying, you don't know. No. You could be just sitting out on a porch, just taking a breath of fresh air, and next thing you know, a tree falls down and kills you. You don't know. You don't know. Somebody could jump a lane or a rail or whatever with their car and just hit you straight on and you're done. You don't know. Anything could happen. But you got to take the warning here. It says, look, who is the trustworthy wise servant? The one who is found so doing when the unexpected timing of the master does actually show up. Okay? That unexpected timing, by the way, might be the fact that you die before he shows up and the next thing you see is him. So that wasn't expected. So you have to be ready for him showing up. Because he might show up after you die, but as far as you're concerned, it's the next minute. You're asleep, and then now you're standing before him, and you're like, uh-oh, I should have taken this more seriously. I should have been awake. Some of you are falling asleep before you, quote, unquote, fall asleep. You're like walking zombies. You're like walking dead. You don't understand. Okay? You guys who are not, if you're not doing what he said, you're dead man walking. Okay? You're just, you're just walking in life, but you're a dead man. Or dead woman, whatever. Okay? You're dead. He's the only thing that has life. And so if you don't have that fully, you don't have life fully. All right? Last one, Joshua 24. All right? And we're going to finish up this teaching. Joshua 24, and we're getting verse 14. All right? And everybody knows the verses we're going to get to because this is commonly, people have this on little placards in their house and everything, and they have no idea what they're claiming. And now, fear Yahweh, serve him in perfection and in truth. Oh, make the effort to be perfect. You can't do that, though, if you don't know what it actually is that you need to be doing. And in truth, in perfection and in truth, and put away the mighty ones. Oh, you know what? I just thought of a verse that I didn't actually have in my notes. Do you know we have that verse that says that he's seeking those that will worship him in what? Spirit and truth. Ah, he just said the same thing right here. What is perfection? Not only walking out the truth, but doing it as intended, with the fullness of the intention. This verse says the same exact thing. I'm going to have to use that from now on too. And now, fear Yahweh, serve him in prayer. By the way, that's you watching the Ruach give me downloads as I'm speaking, okay? That was just something he connected for me in the reading of it. Because he wants you to serve in perfection and in truth. What is perfection meaning? It means you're doing it fully as he intended. Like when he says, I told you in days of old, don't commit adultery, but you're wanting to lust after her. You think you're okay because you didn't actually do the act. He's saying, well, you're still guilty. That's the perfection of it. To perfect a law is to take it in the fullness of what was intended. The spirit of the law. Ah, so worship him in spirit and truth. It's not that ooey gooey Christianized idea. We gotta worship him in spirit and speak in tongues and jump around and roll on floors. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying the spirit of the law as he taught in Matthew. So look what he says here. He says, put away the mighty ones which your father served beyond the river and in Mitzrayim and serve Yahweh. And if it seems evil in your eyes to serve Yahweh, in other words, let's use the right definition here. What does evil mean? In other words, if you think it's too burdensome and suffering and misery and, and harshness, etc., to serve Yahweh, choose for yourself this day whom you're going to serve. See, it's not the evil the way you always thought of the word evil. Go back and listen to, if you haven't heard it, if you're new, go listen to the teaching, what is evil, all right? Now, he says, choose for this, yourselves this day whom you're going to serve, whether the mighty ones which your father served that were beyond the river or the mighty ones of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, but I and my house, we serve Yahweh. So you guys all have these things hanging in your house. Your mother had it in their house, whatever. But are they doing that? No, because they have the ones, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. They don't even know what that means. It's all about commandment keeping. Oh, no. And the people answered and said, far be it from us to forsake Yahweh to serve other mighty ones. For Yahweh our Elohim is he who has brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Mitzrayim from the house of bondage, who did those great signs before our eyes and has guarded us in all the way that we went and among all the people that, through whom we passed. And Yahweh drove out from us 
from before us all the people, even the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We too serve Yahweh, for he is our Elohim. Then Yehoshua said to the people, you are not able to serve Yahweh. Uh Uh-oh. For he is a set-apart Elohim, a jealous El is he. He does not bear with your transgression and with your sins. See, it's not just about idolatry here. He says, you're not, you know, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> Literally, because handling of the truth is handling the Torah, handling, Yeshua, handling Messiah. You, you guys are not rightly handling the word, okay? And he says, you know, he doesn't bear your transgression with your, uh, uh, with your sins. He says, if you forsake Yahweh and shall serve mighty ones of a stranger, then he shall turn back and do evil and consume you after he has done good to you. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we do serve Yahweh. See, a lot of you guys are just like children. As soon as a child gets caught doing something and you say, and you give him a smack or you punish him and take away something, they're like, oh no, I would never do that again. <laughs> Five minutes later, right? But you act like children. So he says, then in verse 22, Hoshua says to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen Yahweh for yourselves to serve him. And they said, witnesses. And now put away the mighty ones of the stranger which is in your midst and incline your heart to Yahweh, uh, Yahweh Elohim of Israel. And the people said to Yehoshua, Yahweh our Elohim we serve and his voice we obey. Well, if that would only be true. Okay, but that's, that's where we should be. You want to say, as for me in my house? Well, what does that look like? The people, he said, but you don't listen. You don't listen. You, you, you say a lot of stuff, but you don't. This should go back actually to the vows section we just did in Numbers 30. They're claiming a bunch of stuff, making all kinds of vows, saying, hey, we're, wit- we're witnesses. You, you can witness against us. Yep, we said it. And let's see how long that lasts. We know it doesn't last very long after when Joshua was talking about it right here. But this is about serving, all right? He says, as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. We'll serve Yahweh. You know, when you go back to the parable we started with in, in Matthew uh, 25, right? That, that parable is all about that he's gonna give you whatever he gives you. And in, in this case, he's giving you a certain level of understanding of his word and of truth. And as he reveals more, you are the owner of what's revealed. He's expecting you to do what he's expecting you to do, what he's expecting you to do with it. Not what others are expecting you to do with it. Because if you do that, you're gonna bear the fruit. You bear the fruit, you're gonna hear the words. Well done, good and trustworthy servant. Like again, you know, in Deuteronomy 10, 12, I didn't, I didn't add that in the notes, but we'll, we'll, I know we covered it earlier in the teaching, but we're just gonna go there again. This is what's expected of us, okay? And now Israel, what is Yahweh really asking of you? But to fear him, right? To walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve him. Now, you're not gonna serve him unless you do the other three things first. You gotta fear him, you gotta walk in his ways, and then you gotta love him. And you love him because in fearing him and walking in his ways, you realize how much he loves you because his ways bless you, keep you safe, and help transform you into what he is. So why wouldn't you want to serve him? But you're going to serve somebody or something, and you're going to be a slave to whom you serve. That choice is yours. So it's my prayer that we all do what we need to do to hear the words, well done, good and trustworthy servant. Amen? Amen. (laughs) Father, Father, we come before you, and Father, we understand the critical nature, the vital nature of the parable of of the servant. All of the parables regarding service. And Father, we, we so desire to hear those words from your mouth, telling us that we have done well and that we have been good and trustworthy in our service. So Father, we ask that you would continue to reveal what needs to be revealed to us that we have not known and understood to do, that you would reveal the things that we're doing that need to stop and cease from being done, and that Father, that you would encourage us and be patient with us as we strive to cling to you and not be useless girdles. So Father, we wanna thank you, we wanna praise you, we wanna give you all glory and honor for all of these things. In the name of all names, our Yeshua, our Messiah, 
Amen ve amen. Amen.